Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. COVID-19 hitting the nation like a hurricane. So now FEMA on its way in. We'll tell you what that means. And it was one very ambitious goal. So how close did the city come to clearing every Detroit street in 24 hours? We're going to begin, though, with the weather. From major snow to bitter cold, we've seen a lot already this week, and yet there is more to come. Glad you're with us today at 5 off the top. If you spend any time outside this morning, you felt those sub-zero temperatures right away. But now we're moving on from the bitter cold to more snow on the way, so let's go ahead and get over to Ben. I'll tell you, we ran out of adjectives to describe what happened this morning, guys. When you looked at your car dashboard and you saw some of these numbers, uh, this was probably difficult to believe. 23 below, that was the temperature, not the wind chill in Lapeer. And the other spots weren't far behind. 20 below Port Huron, 19 below in Ann Arbor. Officially, we were five below at the airport, and that actually came within two degrees of a record. Minus seven, the record. We told you we weren't going to hit it. We were right. <laughs> we were just a lot closer than we anticipated. Uh, Storm Tracker 4 does show that there are snow showers down to the southwest. That's the beginning of our next system. I don't think a lot of that's going to make it in here until about midday tomorrow, but we will see some accumulation. We'll see even more next week. But uh, you may be interested in our final offering more warm temperatures and we'll see how many 40s we can put together in the seven day forecast when we see you again in a few minutes guys. OK, Ben, it's a tall order. Every time there's a big snowstorm, the city of Detroit puts plowing contractors on the clock. 24 hours to clear 1,884 miles of residential streets in the city. That deadline is now passed, so did they get it done? And if not, how close did they get? Victor Williams live tonight along a street on the east side that is still buried in snow, Victor. Yes, Devin and Kimberly, a majority of the roads have been cleared, but as you can tell from this street behind me, they did not meet that 24 hour rule that uh, the mayor had put into place. And now the residents, they have to pay the price. It's crazy. You can see people coming sliding down the street i had to shovel so they won't uh run into my car it's just it's dangerous andrew moore is one of the people living on a handful of streets in detroit that have still yet to be plowed following our most recent snowstorm nah they ain't did no plowing it's been about over 24 hours since we had that snowstorm just a few blocks away however the streets are totally clear Basically, the cars, they made their own way through. No saw truck, no plow truck. I don't even see them coming down the side streets. Mayor Duggan addressing the issue Wednesday at the city's press conference, where he admits there's more work left to be done. It's a challenging job. We had a number of contractors that did extremely well. We had a couple that just could not keep up with the pace, and we're dealing with that now. Even though 85% of the roads have been cleared, Officials say city workers with the Public Works and General Services Department will be joining to assist what's left. As a result, a portion of pay will be cut for city contractors who did not reach their 24-hour goal. A couple of contractors are going to have a deduction from their fee because the city crews had to do part of their work. Uh, but uh, at this point, I think we're pretty well coordinated. In the meantime, Andrew will just have to continue to drive carefully to and from his home on McCormick near Lang while he patiently waits for the city to take care of his street. A lot of people can't even go to work yesterday because people didn't want out plowing or stuff like that. And Mayor Duggan is saying that at this point he would like for all of you to be his eyes and ears. So if you see a street that is yet to be plowed, you can go ahead and contact the city and they'll send out a truck. For now, we are reporting live. Victor Williams, Local 4. All right, Victor. Well, as we keep pointing out, we're largely used to what we're seeing. Many Texans are still dealing with a mess. Power issues following the winter storms there and the continuing cold temperatures across the state. About 3 million customers are still without power. ERCOT, which runs the state's electricity grid, says rolling outages actually saved the system from an uncontrolled blackout. Meanwhile, the outage is forcing many families to take shelter inside their cars to stay warm. We're just hoping that we'll, the lights will come back soon enough because it's really freezing. It's horrible. Well, we're just doing the best, trying to survive. Power companies hope to have more power restored tonight and tomorrow, but it could be the end of the week for others. 
Well, with the severe weather slamming the south, DTE Energy is answering the call to help restore power. About 60 linemen and other support staff hitting the road this morning, heading for Ashland, Kentucky. A third of the customers in eastern Kentucky are without power after being hit with several rounds of severe weather. And these crews are going to help with cleanups and repairs. I heard they got hit with an ice storm, so it's probably going to be um, a lot of ice. Um, this is the part of Kentucky was pretty hilly, so we won't know until we get there, but probably a lot of wired down, broken poles, trees on wires, things such as that. Workers were told could stay in Kentucky for about a week to 10 days. All right, now to the coronavirus and Governor Whitmer holding a briefing today to update the state's response. Discussed a wide range of issues, but tried her best to keep the focus on the push to pass her budget. Rod Maloney live with more on what the governor had to say, Rod. Well, Gavin, here's the thing. The governor has $5.6 billion she wants for COVID response, her total overall budget. And there's a massive gulf between her and the legislature when it comes to how they want to dole out some of that federal money going to COVID. So the governor finds herself trying to steer public opinion in her direction. So even if members of the legislature want to indulge in conspiracy theories or hurl insults, I remain ready. I remain ready to work together to deliver for the people of this state. My judgment will not get clouded by that noise. The governor's trying to set a cooperative tone, but then had a Lansing physician slam the legislature for inaction and doing things on the cheap. Legislative leadership saying this afternoon they expect ongoing discussions, but no one's saying negotiations have started and the House and Senate are a billion dollars apart before they get to the governor's plan, which is a billion dollars more. Meantime, the governor responded to a question about why Wayne and Macomb counties seem to be getting fewer vaccine doses than other counties. And I think is that there just simply are not enough vaccines to meet demand right now. Every state in the nation has that story and every local municipality is confronting that as well. We're as um, eager to get more vaccines into Michigan as, as they are at, at the county level. One of the big concerns worrying the governor's COVID team leader, Dr. Joni Caldoun, is that the variants are showing up here. We currently have 157 cases of this variant identified across 12 counties in the state. We continue to move forward with a proactive public health response. Now, the governor was also asked about the Michigan Restaurant Association and their plan to try and get their restaurants with larger capacity inside. They want to know if the governor had seen it, what she thought of it. She didn't really say she had much to think of it in terms of supporting it because she said she's using science and data to try and make her decisions. But she also said that if the legislature comes through with the money, that gives us more vaccines and therefore thinks restaurants can get open quicker. Reporting live, Rod Maloney, Local 4. All right, Rod. Okay, take a look now at today's coronavirus numbers. The state reports 939 new cases over the past 24 hours. 11 new deaths have also been reported over that same period of time. And on the vaccine side, a little less than 2.3 million doses have made it to Michigan, with 1.6 million of those doses now having been administered. Now, as more vaccine doses make their way to our state, the state's doing uh, is going to be getting some federal help to distribute them. A FEMA strike team is deploying in our state with a specific mission of making sure everyone who wants the vaccine can get it. Sean Lay joins us live tonight. And Sean, this involves a lot of community outreach here. Absolutely, guys. And here's the latest. We just got off the line with Senator Gary Peters. He says when there's a hurricane, FEMA rolls in to help. He says COVID-19 is our hurricane. And he says the state needs mm -hmm. FEMA and needs a lot more vaccine. I understand. We're in a race right now. Senator Gary Peters is concerned about seniors being left behind in getting the COVID-19 vaccine. He's also concerned about the amount of vaccine that Michigan is getting. Peters is the chair of the Homeland Security Committee. That's over FEMA. And now FEMA strike teams are coming into the state. Any area having trouble getting vaccine and getting doses into arms will now get help from FEMA. We have a hurricane that's basically spread across the entire country uh, in this pandemic. Uh, and that's the kind of response that we need from FEMA. The question is, what will it take to get more doses to Michigan, even with the Pfizer plant right here in the state? The senator says he met with President Biden and said Michigan has to get more doses. My words to the president were very clear. Mr. President, uh, we need to have certainty for our local providers to know when they're getting vaccine, not just this week, but for weeks uh, in advance. 
uh, and he was committed to doing that. Back here live, the Senator and President Biden tour the Pfizer plant in Michigan tomorrow. We'll see what that will result in. Coming up at 6 o'clock, guys, when there is just so little vaccine, some areas like here in Richmond, uh, in Macomb County, Richmond Township, are getting very creative to get those vaccines to the most vulnerable. We'll show you at 6. Okay, Sean, we appreciate it. Conservative talk radio pioneer Rush Limbaugh has died. His wife, Catherine, announced his death today on his radio show. Limbaugh was a powerful and often controversial voice in American politics due to his at times incendiary commentary, but still his self-titled show was the most listened to radio talk show in America. He changed politics and he changed broadcasting. Limbaugh passed away after a year-long battle with lung cancer. He was 70 years old. We are off and running here on a Wednesday. Let's check in with Bernie. Hi, this is Bernie Smilovitz. Guess what today was? No, it's not bring your baseball bat to work day. It's the opening of training camp, spring training. Pitchers and catchers reported today in Lakeland. We'll tell you all about it coming up in sports. All right, Bernie, also how Detroit police are taking a major step to try to keep guns out of the hands of children. Larry. An apartment building caught on fire, leaving residents inside, braving the cold temperatures. What about them without a home that's caught on fire? I'm Larry Sproul, and I'll tell you what the management has to say about all of this. 